An emergency can be stressful, but you can take steps to help a person in any emergency situation, from cardiac arrest to choking to life-threatening bleeding. The idea is that you don't have to think about what the specific emergency is. You just need to remember three steps and you'll be prepared to help. The three steps are check, call, and care. The first step is check. This step includes checking for safety, obtaining consent, and checking the ill or injured person. Remember, safety first. You must check the scene to make sure it is safe before you go help the person. Here are some examples. Would you enter a burning building without training? No. Is it safe to cross downed power lines? No. So just check for safety and don't enter an unsafe scene. Instead, immediately call 911 or tell someone to do so. After checking the scene for safety, check the person and obtain consent. Checking the person includes forming an initial impression, then conducting a more thorough check. You should obtain consent after you have formed an initial impression, but before you touch the person to complete your check. So let's address consent first. To obtain consent for a minor, Tell their parent or legal guardian who you are and what you plan to do. This is as simple as saying, my name is Joanne and I'm trained in first aid. I'm gonna check your child and help them based on my training. Then continue helping unless they say they don't want your help. In that case, you can't check or care for the child or infant, but you can call 911 if you think they need help. If the parent or legal guardian of a minor is not present, Consent is implied under the law. Basically, the law assumes the parent or guardian would give consent if they were present. So go ahead and help the child or infant. And now let's address checking the person. You must check the person to determine what is wrong and what you should do next. You can usually get an idea of what's going on with the person as you approach them. This is called the initial impression. As you form an initial impression, ask yourself, does the person appear unresponsive? Do they seem to be breathing? Are they bleeding a lot? Do they look sick or hurt? When you reach the person, you have a decision to make based on whether the person appears unresponsive, is experiencing a life-threatening emergency, or has a non-life-threatening injury or illness. It's a lot to take in, so let's break it down. Okay, if the person appears unresponsive during the initial impression, you need to check them for responsiveness. At the same time, you should check for breathing, life-threatening bleeding, and any other life-threatening condition that you might not have seen during the initial impression. To check for responsiveness, quickly do the shout, tap, shout sequence. Simply shout the child's name, tap them on their shoulder or their arm, and shout again. For an infant, shout their name, tap them on the bottom of their foot, and shout their name again. Noah, sweetie. Noah. If the child or infant does not respond to you in any way, such as by moving, opening their eyes, or moaning, they're unresponsive. You can check for breathing while checking for responsiveness. First, make sure the person is face up. If they are face down, roll them onto their back, taking care not to create or worsen an injury. Then look to see if the person's chest is rising and falling. Normal breathing is quiet, regular, and effortless. Agonal breaths, or isolated, or infrequent gasps are not considered normal breathing. To check for life-threatening bleeding or other life-threatening conditions, quickly scan down the person's body looking for blood or other signs and symptoms. Okay, he's not responsive and not breathing. I'll need to start CPR. Checking for responsiveness, breathing, life-threatening bleeding and other life-threatening conditions might seem like a lot to do at once. But remember, it is a quick check that should take no more than five to 10 seconds. Now, if at any time you determine the person is experiencing a life-threatening emergency, that is, they are unresponsive, responsive but not fully awake, not breathing, experiencing life-threatening bleeding, or they have another life-threatening condition, stop the check step and immediately move to the call step. Then give care according to your level of training. 
In addition, you should continue your check, as appropriate, to determine if additional care is needed. If your initial check reveals that they are experiencing a non-life-threatening illness or injury, you will also continue your check of the person to see if they have conditions that may require care. To continue your check, first ask the person questions about their health and what is wrong, and then check them for signs of illness or injury. When giving care for children and infants, you'll often need to ask the parent or guardian questions about the child's or infant's health and signs and symptoms in addition to talking with the child. So, how do you remember what questions to ask? You can use SAM to help you remember. What does SAM stand for? Signs and symptoms, allergies, medications, and medical conditions. Simple to remember, right? You would ask the person questions like, what is bothering you? Do you have any allergies? Do you take any medications? Do you have any medical conditions? That's it. All you have to do is remember SAM, signs and symptoms, allergies, medications, and medical conditions. Very simple, very straightforward. Next, you should do a quick focus check of the person. What you check is based on what the person or the parent or guardian has told you, how they are acting, and what you see. So if the person tells you that their arm hurts, focus your check there and look for signs of an injury. Or if the person is crying and grimacing in pain and you see some blood on the ground that seems to be coming from underneath their leg, carefully check for an injury to their leg or back. The person may have multiple signs of an injury or illness in different areas of their body. For example, they may report pain in their stomach and pain in their hip. In this case, be sure to do a focus check in each of these areas. The reason you should ask questions and do a focus check is because as time goes on, the person may be less able to say things. You may gather information that others may not be able to gather later. So after check, the next step is call. Of course, you'll want to care for the person right away, but first you want to make sure other help is on its way if necessary, and that you have the equipment you need to help. Therefore, call may include calling 911 to activate emergency medical services and getting equipment such as an AED, a first aid kit, and a bleeding control kit. Depending on the circumstances, you can either send someone to do this or do it yourself. Just a quick note. Throughout the course, we will refer to 911 as the emergency number to call. In most areas, 911 will work. However, if you live or work in an area without 911, use the local designated emergency number. Also, if your facility uses an internal number to activate an emergency action plan and EMS, use that number. Okay, so based on the type of injury or illness the person has, you can decide whether or not you need to call 911. If you didn't find anything, or the person only has a minor injury or illness, you may not need to call 911 for help. This may be something that you can handle on your own using your first aid skills and guidance from the Red Cross First Aid app. In this case, get or have someone get a first aid kit and move to care. However, if you do need to call 911, either make the call yourself or ask someone at the scene to do it. Using a cell phone to call for help is nice, especially when you put it on speakerphone. EMS dispatchers are often trained to give you guidance. If you ask someone to make the call, always pick someone specific. If you just yell, someone call 911, you won't know for sure if it's going to get done. So instead, look directly at one person and say, you, call 911. That way you know who made the call and that help is on the way. The final step is to give care according to the conditions that you find and your level of knowledge and training. Throughout the course, we will teach specific action steps that you can take to give care for life-threatening emergencies. 
you should always follow these general guidelines. Give care consistent with your knowledge and training. Offer to assist the person with medication administration if needed. Help the person rest in the most comfortable position. Keep the person from getting chilled or overheated. Reassure the person by telling them that you will help and that EMS personnel has been called if appropriate. Continue to watch for changes in the person's condition, including breathing and level of responsiveness. No matter what the emergency is, the check, call, care approach will get you through it. Throughout this course, we'll give you key information that will help you save a life. But above all else, we want you to remember these three steps. Check, call, care. In every skill we teach you, we'll keep going through these steps. That way, in an emergency, you can revert to something simple that you can easily remember. This will help you remain calm, feel confident, and make you more successful at helping to save someone's life.